Hello, my name is Mike Martinez, and this is my final presentation for MCB 3841. Uh, the topic of today's presentation is the effects of microbially derived volatile organic compounds on insect succession of carrion. We're going to begin our discussion off by talking about what saprophilus insects are, as well as uh, carrion resources and how the two are uh, incredibly dependent on one another. So saprophilus insects are insects that rely on carrion for feeding and overposition. Uh, so basically what this means is that these insects uh, rely on dead or decaying animals or matter uh, for nutritional resources as well as a site to lay their eggs. And a great example of these saprophilus insects is this beetle you see here uh, called Nicrophorus orbicolis more commonly known as the carrion beetle. These beetles are incredibly interesting in the sense that they exhibit a very rare form of uh, biparental care. Uh, typically in the insect world, we don't really see uh, too many examples of biparental care outside of uh, the beetle family. But in addition to this uh, biparental care, they also have pre-overpositional and post-overpositional care mechanisms to really ensure the fitness of their offspring as well as themselves. So a little more background on N. orbicolis. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, they exhibit biparental care, and this pre-overpositional care comes in the form of uh, preparation of what is called a brood ball, and this brood ball preparation uh, happens when the beetle locates a carrion resource. And again, we'll get into uh, the specifics of how that all happens. So once they find this resource, they will remove all the hair, feathers, fur, anything externally on the animal. And they will place these anal and oral secretions uh, on the carcass. Now, uh, keep that in the back of your head. We're going to talk about that in a, a few slides, but it's very important um, to kind of combat the diverse microbial community that's existing on this carcass. And so when a beetle is looking for this resource, there is some factors that come into play. Uh, obviously, they want the resource to be good for their brood to ensure fitness. So what are some things they're looking for? Maybe size, uh, carcass age. So it turns out that um, the size of the carcass does not play a huge role in uh, sort of this decision on uh, the beetle's part. And we can see this uh, through results of an experiment I conducted uh, a few years ago with Dr. Stephen Trumbo. And we looked at uh, the effect of carcass size on brood quality. So basically we set up two uh, little micro environments in red solo cups with uh, sterile soil and two mouse carcasses. We had uh, one cup had a large mouse carcass, another cup had a small mouse carcass, and we placed two gravid females, uh, one in each cup. And we let, uh, we let them lay their eggs and then we did some, uh, some uh, quantitative measurements on the brood. So what we see here was that the total average larval number, meaning how many larvae were present, was far greater for the large carcass, almost seven more larvae present with the cup containing the large mouse carcass. And this, of course, correlates to a uh, a greater total average mass of all of the larvae combined. But the interesting finding from this experiment was that the individual larval mass was actually greater for uh, larvae found on the smaller carcass. So what this demonstrates is that larval physiology was not significantly affected by carcass size, but the brood is somehow regulated before hatching. We know that after hatching there is um, an obvious form 
of regulation in the form of infanticide. However, this pre-ovipositional uh, regulation mechanism is still unknown. One thing is for sure though, these beetles definitely know how to get the most bang for their buck. So now we're going to move on to the stages of decay and volatile organic compounds derived from microbes. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, these beetles will place these anal and oral secretions onto their carcass, and these not only act as infochemicals to the brood to signal this is where your food resource is, but they act as antimicrobials. Now, this is incredibly paramount to the fitness of uh, the larva because microbial activity increases throughout the decay process up until the dry remains stage. There is typically five stages of decay, fresh, bloat, post bloat, uh, also known as active decay, and then advanced decay, and lastly, uh, dry remains. So uh, decay is facilitated by these microbes and this microbial community existing on and within the, the carcass. They basically uh, facilitate the breakdown of nutrients with high molecular weight into simpler volatile organic compounds. This actually accounts for uh, the bloated stage when these macromolecules are getting uh, broken down. They volatilize and they actually bloat the carcass, hence the name bloated. So because these microbial communities are increasing as decay continues, that poses a risk to beetle larva. Uh, there's obvious competition between the larva and the microbes, and these microbes pose a direct threat to the health of uh, the larva. So it was found that uh, these antimicrobials actually act as lysozymes for gram-positive bacteria existing on and within the carcass. An experiment conducted by Dangerfield and colleagues in 2020 uh, looked at bovine carcasses throughout the five stages of decay, and they frequently sampled these carcasses uh, in order to do bacterial 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. So the results of this study demonstrated that there is a very diverse uh, community residing on these bovine carcasses mainly consi consisting of these uh, seven genera of uh, bacteria. And this figure three uh, displays these, uh, these seven genera as well as their proportionality. And we can see that as uh, the carcass continues to age, these uh, bacteria proportions increase. And that is in line with uh, most research in uh, the field of forensics as well as forensic entomology. Here we see in figure four uh, the bacterial communities of each stage of decomposition and we can see here that it is obviously very diverse and very uh, variable uh, between stages. Fresh stage we see that there is domination by these uh, Santa Mandales as well as a fair amount of uh, ubiquitous taxa throughout uh, the three main stages. However, we get into the bloat stage and we see that these enterobacteriales uh, orders are sort of dominating things. So obviously, uh, placing these uh, anal and oral secretions onto these carcasses acts as a very good way to ensure health of the larva. Uh, it was actually shown to increase larval success almost twofold when uh, these secretions were present versus when they were absent. So now we're going to move on to our discussion of volatile organic compounds. So as we just saw in the last slide, these microbial uh, communities are constantly changing throughout the decay process and increasing, and this has a direct effect on the odor bouquet produced by the carcass. So as we said before, these microbes facilitate the breakdown of macromolecules 
into their smaller component parts known as volatile organic compounds. Uh, we'll abbreviate that as VOCs. And these VOCs directly change their composition and their concentration as a, a direct result of the changing of microbial community concentration and makeup. So the, the basic gist to take away from this is that the process of decay is an incredibly dynamic process and it's constantly undergoing uh, changes which have a direct result on the odor bouquet produced. So what is the meaning of this? What ramifications does this have ecologically? Well, VOCs act as semiochemicals, which are basically chemicals that help uh, with insect communication. Uh, a very common example of semiochemicals are things like pheromones and alleochemicals. Now, this is incredibly sensitive to insects, which have uh, developed incredibly advanced olfactory systems. Uh, these chemical concentrations and odor bouquets communicate very, very specific information to insects, and even the slightest difference in odor, bu odor bouquet or uh, chemical concentration or composition can communicate a radically different signal uh, to an insect. Now, a study by Kalanova and colleagues in 2009 uh, strove to demonstrate just how uh, diverse and dynamic this process of decay is. So we looked at uh, these volatile organic compounds listed up here as decay progressed through six days. As we could see, some of these compounds start off with a very low concentration, but as we can see, as we progress day two, medium concentration back down to a lower concentration on day six. That's for one chemical. We look over here for dimethyl sulfide. Uh, similar trend, a little different. We have very low concentration on day one, moving into day two, very high. Five and six days, medium concentration. And we can go through and look at that for every chemical. It's variant. It's constantly changing. And that just basically shows that decay is incredibly dynamic. These chemical concentrations are changing constantly. Now, these compounds listed to the left are organosulfur compounds, also known as SVOCs. And there is strong evidence that sulfur-containing volatile organic compounds are incredibly important for uh, insect attraction and succession of carrion. We will now get into what some researchers call the smell of death, an irresistible bouquet, and you'll see why in just a few seconds. So, the Kirschitter in 2012 strove to determine uh, how many uh, VOCs were present in the headspace of a decaying pig. Uh, Pigs are often used as human analogs for these uh, forensic studies. But uh, using two-dimensional gas chromatography coupled with time-of-flight mass, spectro mass spectrometry, uh, very state-of-the-art headspace analysis technique, they determined that there were 830 volatile organic compounds present in the headspace of a decaying pig so 830 VOCs, that is an absolutely astounding number. So the data was put onto these two graphical representations. Figure four down here is showing the total number of released compounds throughout decay. We have the four stages of decay, fresh, bloat, active, and advanced on the x-axis represented in days post-death. And on the y-axis, we have number of VOCs. Now we can see here that uh, day 26 into advanced decay here, the total number of VOCs present peaks at around 236 uh, chemicals identified. But it's important to understand that over here in figure 6, although during these days there is the most amount of chemicals present, this does not mean that this is the most diverse uh, stage of decay. We actually see greater chemical diversity 
in these late advanced uh, decay stages down here. However, if we look up here, uh, days one through eight, we see very trace amounts of sulfur compounds and a, a fairly substantial amount of these aromatic compounds such as indole. This is going to be important, important for later slides, so keep that in mind. Uh, and then we see later on down here, as we get into active decay around 22 days, and even later stage advanced decay, especially in these later stage uh, advanced decay days, we see sulfur compounds are very much so uh, dominating things here. Okay, so now we're going to get into the importance of sulfur containing uh, volatile organic compounds. There is strong evidence uh, which suggests that uh, dimethyl sulfide, dimethyl disulfide, dimethyl trisulfide, methane thiol, and S-methyl thioacetate are incredibly important to insect attraction to carrion. Uh, suggestions that they are key uh, semiochemicals and they help insects discriminate between various things such as carcass age and uh, whether or not it's a feeding resource or an overposition resource. So this study done by Podskalska and colleagues in 2009 conducted field experiments with Nicrophorus vespio using synthetic chemical blends. Uh, the SVOCs that they used were determined from the Kalanova study uh, and they were determined to be dimethyl sulfide, dimethyl disulfide, dimethyl trisulfide, methane thiol, and the methyl thioacetate molecules. Uh, this experiment only considered uh, these top three, DMS, DMDS, and DMTS, and the experiment was as followed. There were 20 traps, each containing 11 pits. Uh, we could see that represented uh, schematically here in figure one. Uh, 10 sets contained a triplet of DMS, DMTS, and DMDS, and the remaining 10 sets contained a blank in place of DMTS. So that's this, uh, this red box up here. The center uh, pit was either a DMTS or a blank. And the reason they did uh, 10 and 10 was to test for any sort of synergistic effects of DMTS, DMDS, and DMS. So the results of this experiment were as followed. Uh, we see they did discriminate for sex, uh, graphing males and females. They found about 369 beetles captured across four beetle species. Uh, this experiment did not take into account ovarian status though. So we see here that DMDS was highly successful for both males and females in comparison to DMS, but even more so, uh, trapping success strongly increased in the presence of DMTS and DMDS, indicating that there was a, uh, a good synergism between DMTS and DMDS. Uh, we see a similar but weaker trend with uh, DMTS and DMS. So if we uh, consult again the smell of death, we see that around uh, active decay, 22 to 29 days, especially on day 22, this quarter slice of pie here is represented by sulfur containing compounds. Again, very important for insect colonization. And in this case, uh, this data matches up. So these different odor blends affect the response. There's not only a synergism between SVOCs and uh, dimethyl trisulfide, dimethyl disulfide, but there's also other trends across other uh, genera and species as well. For example, for example, Lucilia sericata changes their semiochemical preference based on specific foraging needs. What this means is that if the fly is looking for a place to feed, uh, they're going to look for specific, specific odor cues versus if they're looking for a place to oviposit. So one particular experiment by Brody in 2016 looked at indole by itself and indole in the presence of alcohols. Now the reason we looked at indole with alcohols was because 
these flies will typically feed on dung and indole uh, in the presence of phenol, MP, cresol, or 1-octin-3-ol is very common in the headspace of uh, canine feces, which L. sericata uh, prefers as a food source. So information that leads to uh, a good signal that this is a food resource would be indole in the presence of one or more of these three alcohols, phenol, M or P cresol, or one octin ol As uh, I said in the last slide, they're very common in the headspace of canine feces, which is a common food source for uh, L. sericata. All right, continuing on, we're gonna look at now the information that leads to the cue that this is a good spot for overposition. So trace amounts of DMTS are good indicators of fresh carrion. However, as decay continues, uh, concentrations of these aromatic compounds, such as indole, uh, begin to accumulate. And if you recall back to that graph of the smell of death, uh, these aromatic compounds really start to dominate things towards uh, the later stages of decay, mostly advanced. So this basically tells the fly that, hey, this carcass is old, it's probably already been colonized, uh, this is not a good spot for overposition. So typically, if you're getting DMTS alone, trace amounts, it tells the fly, hey, this is a good spot to put your eggs, uh, the carcass is fresh, it's new, uh, probably not colonized yet, this is a good spot. You get this blend of DMTS with indole, and it signals something completely different, and it makes the resource repulsive to L. sericata. Now we're going to talk about any differences between sex, ovarian status, and chemical concentration, and how this uh, affects the way chemical cues are interpreted and received by insects. So physiology and ovarian status. Uh, gravidity is a term that we're going to use, and uh, to be gravid just means to be with eggs. So whether or not a female is uh, gravid or not will definitely affect how a chemical signal is interpreted. Uh, as we just saw before with uh, L. sericata, these chemical cues convey different messages about feeding or uh, overposition. So whether or not a female is gravid or not will definitely affect how these cues are interpreted. And there was an experiment conducted by Liu and colleagues in 2016, uh, which looked at these differences in sex and ovarian status of L. sericata, uh, this time in response to DMDS, and they used a bioassay technique uh, called Y olfactometry, in which there is a, uh, a two-choice tube, and the flies can go to uh, whichever side of the tube that they're, they're choosing. And the treatment was uh, DMDS versus a control of acetone. This experiment looked at 20 males, 20 non-gravid females, and 20 gravid females. So the results, there were marginal differences in response to dimethyl disulfide between males and females, and they found that high dosages of DMDS were generally attractive to females independent of their ovarian status, but more so repulsive to the males. So low doses of DMDS repelled gravid females but attracted males. So here we just see a graphical depiction of this of, of these results. And as we could see here for this very low dose of 0 0.05 micrograms, we're seeing that gravid females, there's a way lower percentage of responses compared to non-gravid females and males. But if we look at all these other uh, test dosages, 0 0.05, 0 0.25, the difference is pretty marginal, uh, especially down here at this extremely low dose. Pretty, they're all in the same ballpark. And here we just see the graphical representation of this gravid females responding very low compared to the control against males, which are very attracted at these uh, these low doses of DMDS. So this brings us to the culmination of all these discussions about saprophilus insects, carrion resources, and VOCs, insect succession on carrion. What this basically means is which 
uh, species, families of insects are colonizing the resource and when. So as it turns out, the very first colonizers on most carrion resources are uh, those belonging to the Dipterans and Californidae. These are your Saprophilus flies. Uh, as we saw uh, earlier in this presentation, there's a lot of experiments done on uh, Lucilia sericata. Uh, they're a great example of these Saprophilus flies and they're early colonizers. Uh, as we said before, they respond very well to trace amounts of DMTS, which is very, very characteristic of the first uh, one to four days of this decay process. So these Dipterans and Californidae are usually followed by the Sarcophagidae. Uh, these are flesh flies, again, more, uh, more species of flies. And around uh, still early in the decay process, definitely not late uh, advanced decay, but more so towards the active decay side of things, we see this colonization by the Coloptera families. Uh, these are your beetles, your necrophorous beetles, burying beetles, carrion beetles, all sorts of beetle species. Uh, this is if they're for uh, looking for a food resource. Typically, if this is something like Necrophorus orbicolis, uh, we would see uh, colonization of these carrion resources uh, much earlier, along with these Dipterans and Californidae. Again, as we said before, it's all dependent on circumstance and what the specific need of the insect is at that time. Okay, so there's obviously some big implications of this research, and a big one is forensic entomology. This is uh, basically a, a subset of forensics which tries to look at uh, entomological data, uh, ecological data, insect succession of carrion, uh, headspace VOC analysis to try to determine the relative age of a cadaver. So just a quick example, say you're an investigator and you have a cadaver that you found and you're trying to estimate how old uh, this cadaver is. Typically, traditionally, a coroner will only be able to accurately determine the age of the carcass if it's relatively about a few weeks old. But if we use forensic entomology, we look at which insects are present, uh, which headspace VOCs are present, we could fairly accurately determine uh, how old a cadaver is just by looking at those things. Another big one is livestock and pest control. So blowflies are a pest of economic importance. Uh, understanding which odor blends that effectively uh, attract and repel them can allow the pest control industries to uh, effectively create a blend that uh, does its job well. Another example of this are insects which are responsible for diseases. So screw worms are an obligate parasite which will infect an open wound of uh, livestock animals and they will lay their eggs in this wound. And this causes myasis, uh, which is an infestation and the feeding on of live tissue of animals. And this ultimately results in death if not treated. Uh, another disease vector uh, insect, such as mosquitoes, uh, they might not be saprophilus or necrophagus, but they, uh, they do transmit uh, diseases, uh, West Nile, uh, things of that nature. So understanding which odor and chemical blends are repulsive to these animals can help us create effective uh, means of controlling their populations and controlling their infestations. All right, here we see our references for this study and our image citations. And I would like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Stephen Trumbo of the Yukon EEB department for uh, taking me under his wing and allowing me to help him with uh, his passion and his area of research. And uh, that will conclude this uh, presentation. Hope you all enjoyed. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.